How's it going, Chasers? I hope you're having a kick-ass week. A quick little video, a PSA, to remember to check your tools, guys. No, this isn't a testicular cancer video, although, you know, good idea to check those too. But what I'm saying is the equipment that you rely on or use to gather information to make decisions on what you do throughout the distilling process, it's awesome to have it, but you kind of need to use a little bit of common sense and kind of fact check the data that you're getting from these things because three things have gone wrong today that led to this impromptu video being recorded. So let me lay the, uh, the groundwork for this video. Give me an insight into my headspace at the moment. First of all, I'm running the still over there. I'm making a fruit brandy and that's not something I do that often. So I kind of feel uh, a little bit unsure of what's happening over there, although it's going well. Uh, behind me, I'm doing a mash as well. I'm pretty used to mashing stuff, so I'm not so worried about that. Uh, but I'm doing a third thing as well. I'm also recording talky bits for a different video. So my head's kind of, a lot of my bandwidth at the moment is going towards kind of writing a script as I'm talking about it, if that makes sense. First up, I started checking uh, where heads versus hearts were gonna come in on the brandy. And I was doing it by taste, but I thought, you know what, I'm not, I'm not so used to making cuts for a brandy. So I decided to quickly check the ABV with a alcohol refractometer. This said it was over 80%. And I thought, eh, maybe, maybe it's still over 80%, but you know what, I'll check with a hydrometer as well, because these things are notoriously inaccurate, especially at higher ABVs. This one said 93%. I thought, okay, well, it must be 93%. Waited for a little while and decided, you know what, it is totally hearts. I'm gonna make the hearts cut right now. Great. Now I'm starting to think about when the tails is coming. So I take this and check it again, and it says 80%. That's strange. It surely, surely, in a pot still run, hours later, it cannot be above 80%. So we'll go back to this guy. 78%. Okay, maybe? Yeah, it still seems a little bit high, but sure. It turns out this thing, I guess I dropped it too many times or something, it's just completely and utterly wrong. It reads 0% for water. Great, so I can't really calibrate it. But anything over about 15% alcohol, it just reads 80% or over now, which is bizarre. So I threw this away and went back to using this. And after using this a few more times, I finally realized, look at that. Yeah, that's alcohol that is inside the hydrometer. And it turns out there's a tiny little hairline crack on the bottom here, rendering this thing completely and utterly useless. My senses, what I was tasting off the still, was telling me there's no way it's still 75%. My taste was telling me that I was in hearts when I was worrying about that, and my taste is starting to tell me that I should be thinking about looking for tails soon. But the instruments were telling me I was probably wrong. Thankfully, <laughs> I have a second uh, alchemeter, alcohol-tuned hydrometer, whatever you want to call this thing, and this thing is uh, aligning with what my senses are telling me, so don't worry, the uh, distillation's still on track. So that's two of the things that went wrong. Let's talk about uh, the mash. In here we have about 50 litres of water, five kilograms of New Zealand peated malt, four kilograms of distiller's malt, 1.5 kilograms of Shepherd's Delight, and two kilograms of oats. Uh, I'm making something between a white whiskey and a vodka that hopefully is relatively smooth, but slightly smoky uh, for Anyone want to guess what uh, thing I'm kind of obsessed with at the moment and uh, I want to make a smoky version of? Ha <laughs> ha, feel free to uh, guess down there. This is a sneak preview of that. I'm using the claw hammer setup for the mash at the moment, which I absolutely love, by the way. Uh, and using the handy dandy little, can you see that? Controller that lets me set the temperature and pretty much forget about it, which is great. So I set it at 65 degrees Celsius, mashed in, let it do its thing, Bob's your uncle, happy as, came back and had a look at it about half an hour later and something just didn't look right. It didn't look like a mash should look. It just kind of looked like murky water. <laughs> I started stressing about it a little bit, gave it a stir and realized that it didn't 
feel quite right. Didn't feel hot enough to me. So after that debacle with the hydrometers, the first thing I did is went and grabbed the uh, thermometer that I trust the most in the house, which is the one I use for cooking. And lo and behold, it was only 55 degrees Celsius uh, in the pot, 10 degrees too low. That's probably why it's not working. And then I remembered the last time I'd used this controller, uh, I decided to actually figure out how to use it and mess around with a whole bunch of different things. Uh, and I found out that they have a um, temperature offset or calibration built into it, which is pretty freaking cool. So you can have, um, you know, like you can calibrate it, put a bunch of water in here, uh, get it to a certain temperature, set it to 50 degrees, check it with a known thermometer that you trust, check what it says on the controller, put an offset in so the number that is being read out on the screen is actually true. And, it, and I guess uh, when I was messing around with that controller, I had set the temperature offset to be at the extreme, which is bizarre. Because I mean, I used this exact unit with the claw hammer guys when they were here, uh, and we didn't have that issue at all. So I guess it was me playing around with it and doing silly things. So all of this to say team, uh, yes, having equipment is great. Having good equipment that you can trust more or multiple sets of equipment that you can cross-reference against each other is excellent. But at the end of the day, uh, sometimes there's certain situations where just building up a little bit of experience and doing things, actually being aware of what you're doing and taking note of what things look like and feel like and smell like and taste like, that's kind of invaluable. I guess this applies to almost anything that gives you data that we could be using in this hobby. So, you know, thermometers, alchemeters, hydrometers, um, thermocouples, uh, volume measurements as well. So like if you're using a volumetric flask or a jug with liter increments on the side. Uh, dude, I've, I mean, I've talked to engineers uh, that talk about having to check rulers, which is something I'd never thought about before that, right? Like, just because you buy a ruler and it says this is 10 centimeters doesn't mean it actually is. Uh, what else do we actually use? We're not using rulers that often. Uh, scales, wait, well, there you go. Uh, my daughter and I, uh, I've just helped her build her second Pinewood Derby car. I helped her last year and we got disqualified because we kept coming flying off the tracks. By the way, go the fishy and uh, Aria took first place. She's uh, doing nationals in a little while. Uh, but we had a set of scales that we were weighing to make sure the car wasn't overweight. And we we're about two grams underweight. We're thinking that's probably safe. And I thought, you know what? Let's just grab another couple of set of scales and check. And it turns out we were actually uh, more like 15 grams underweight and we had a whole lot of headroom and a whole lot of speed we we're leaving on the table uh, by not putting more weight on the car. Another example of how this can rear its ugly head. So team, if you've got horror stories about how things like this have caught you out, let us know in the comments down below. Uh, we will sympathize with you, I promise. We'll laugh at you, but we'll sympathize with you. And I'll catch you next time team. Keep on chasing the craft. See ya.